my belief is when you truly commit to something and you put it out there to the universe, it will bring you an opportunity right away. But you have to commit. It's this idea of like, you have to meet the universe halfway. And I'm sure you've experienced this. So what I did, I was at Shutterfly and I wanted to start my own business. And at the time I had my kids, were, I had only had two kids then and the middle one was very young. And so I made a commitment that my commitment to that dream was from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. would be my time to work on my business. I would create a website. We often obsess over the website, but I would do like, I would just, I would start, I would make a website. What I actually would say is instead of committing to make a website, commit to figuring out how to get one client, just one client. It's like, stop reading the information, stop, because you will, there's too much out there. You won't know what to do until you just start working with people. So just commit to getting one client and set a time, a, commit to a set amount of time, whatever you can do to just have the space to do things, whether it's writing a blog post, writing a website. Now, what I always tell people who are like, I'm gonna quit, like, what do I do? I actually would say, don't bother with a website. I would say, write an email, craft an email that you're gonna send to all your friends, everyone you know, where you're saying, hey, I'm building a side hustle. And I'm, I'm, I would love to write emails for so-and-so and just get clear on like who you would like to help and what you could do and get as specific as you can and send that email out to everyone you know and ask them, who do you know who might need this? You will get a job. You commit to time set and you commit to just putting it out there and letting some people know, I guarantee you will get something, something will come through. So stop listening, stop learning, stop listening to all the things, commit to some time, do one action and just think, I'm gonna get my first client and you will get that first client and then you will just take it from there. Welcome to the Paid Copywriter Podcast. This is for free thinkers and introverts who just don't fit the nine to five mold and want to break free and start a business of one. I share all of the tips, strategies, and behind the scene fails of how I transitioned from a nine to five career to freelance writing despite having no experience. So if you wanna learn all things copywriting, persuasion, psychology, and marketing, make sure you subscribe or follow whether you're listening to this on podcast or YouTube. Hey, Christine, it's great to be here. So I'm Emma Stratton. I'm the founder of Punchy, which is a consultancy and training firm that helps B2B tech companies connect with their audiences through clear, simple human messaging. So I focus on messaging strategy, which is really helping companies understand what they should be saying to the market, to their customers, which directly informs all the sales and marketing activities, with copywriting being one of them. Awesome. I'm curious, at what stage does a marketing team hire you and bring you on? Like, what does that look like? Because I think a lot of writers want to add consulting and to their services. And I'm just curious how you do it. Yeah. So Messaging strategy typically comes in when the company is ready to make some kind of meaningful shift. So on one level, it can be messaging for a new campaign. So when I worked at Shutterfly, for example, we would do a messaging strategy for the new fall campaign or the new winter campaign where, you know, we're going to do this new thing and we need to know what kind of the core story is here so that all the assets whether it's over email, on the website, social media, is all really kind of singing from the same hymn sheet, if you will. But typically, when I work with clients, I work with larger B2B tech companies, and they'll come to me when maybe their product has changed and they need to tell a new story to the world, to the market, or maybe they have acquired another business, which changes how they show up in the world. So it's typically there is a large strategic moment in that company in their growth journey where they basically need a new story. Their old story isn't working anymore and they need to figure out what this new one is. And, you know, I work with really smart marketers and it's not that they can't do it themselves. It's just, it's often hard to do it for your own team, for your own company. We have a lot of internal biases. So bringing in an outside consultant who can help them kind of craft that story is, is really powerful. Got it. I want to touch on what you said about smart marketers, because I think one of the things in B2B 
and this field in general is that it can be intimidating to pitch any type of service to them in general, because other than writing as a deliverable, you know, they know they need writing. They know they don't have the time to create the deliverable, but when it comes to strategy and consulting, I think that is nerve wracking to come in and say like, Hey, let me work on your strategy because they seem to have it all figured out. And especially if they have like a loud LinkedIn presence and they seem super dialed in. Right. Totally. So, you know, I didn't dive in day one and become, you know, this consultant working with leadership teams at large, well-known famous tech companies, which I am today. I did not start that way, of course. However, I know myself. So I started, I, I'm a writer, first of all, born a writer, writing my whole life. Had a wild and weird journey or I did, you know, I was an editor. I was a travel writer. I went into branding. I did strategy. I did copy. I led a copy team. I did all those things, but I know that one of my strengths is strategic thinking. So I can't help but simplify things. I can't help but ignore all the details and see the big picture in every situation. And so that was really just my natural strength. And something I learned as I went along in the journey is you really want to not only do the work you love, but also things that you have a natural strength, because that's kind of like your superpower. So I knew that I was strategic, that I could help people see the big picture. And so when I started in my business, I was mainly working with founders whose company wasn't going yet. So they were maybe pitching for funding. You know, I worked at a pretty low price point to help these kind of visionary entrepreneurs kind of figure out <laughs> how to talk about what they were selling. And so it was a natural progression. As you go, as you build experience, then you build the confidence to say, hey, I can do this. I can help you. But it, you know, it was a journey. It took me a few years to, to get to that point. But that confidence piece is a big part in consulting. You, you have to have that confidence and be able to bring it because you need to, <laughs> you need to convey, you need to share that confidence with them. You know, you want them to feel like, oh, phew, we can trust this person that we've brought in and they're going to be able to help. Yeah. How did you learn about, well, first of all, I want to underline what you said about working with more early stage startups. Cause I think that's like a very underrated hack for anybody who wants to transition from a nine to five to becoming self-employed and becoming a full-time freelancer. Sometimes the people who are most likely to give you a chance are the newer companies that, you know, are just looking for help and they're more early stage. So I'm really glad that you underline that. How would you say you learned about branding in general? Because it sounds like you started your career more in copywriting and editing and creating those deliverables. And then at a certain point, you felt confident making the transi transition to branding. But where did your education come from? Was it books, podcasts? Yeah, I'm... I'm like a, a, a weirdo. <laughs> I think my whole life I've been trying to figure out how to apply my gifts in the working world. And I've had a hard time figuring out how to do it. Nothing quite felt right. So I did journalism. I edited a magazine in the UK. And I, and I thought that was the job for me. I was, you know, I, it was cool. It was editing like a really cool teen magazine in England, like rock and roll bands. I loved music. So it was fun, but I was like, I'm not a journalist. I don't have a nose for the story. I just, I, I hate interviewing people. <laughs> like it's not this. And I started looking for another job and I just happened to see this. There was an opportunity to be a strategic writer at a branding agency. So it was working on brands for major consumer packaged goods, like famous toilet papers and, you know, Colgate, like just big brands. So it was sort of like a lucky break. I didn't even know that existed. I didn't know that was a thing. I didn't really know what branding was. So I got on the job experience with branding. So once I learned what that was, I then took another job a couple of years later at a B2B marketing agency by accident. I thought it was going to be the same as <laughs> consumer branding. And I was like, oh, I'm, you know, I can do this. I don't have any B2B experience. And they hired me. And it was a shock at first because it was so different. And I was like, whoa, I'm not, I shouldn't have done this. Like, I don't understand what these people are writing about. This is so confusing. We had a software company, but then I sort of started applying kind of things that I had figured out through branding to these software companies that I was suddenly marketing for. And it clicked for me. Oh, these people need help. 
oh, I can help them in an interesting way because I don't have a typical background. And so it was really just this natural progression. It did come from job experience. So I did kind of work in corporate or for agencies in this space, but it was very much following where I, I what I enjoyed and also where I saw a need. When I decided to quit the agency job and start my own consultancy, just helping tech startups tell their story, everyone told me it was a terrible idea. And these were like, one was like a CMO of a well-known tech company at the time and just other people in the tech space. And they're like, no one's going to pay for that. Like, that's a bad idea. And I was like, well, I'm going to do it anyway and just see if it works. So that's a long-winded answer to your question. So it was a mix of on the job, but also following what interested me and what I thought could be a good idea. Can you go into the difference between the CPG brands and the B2B world and what you experience? Because I teach an online course that mentors aspiring freelancers. And we have a, I have a module that is all based around choosing your niche. And one of the aspects of choosing your niche is understanding whether or not your interest falls into B2B or B2C or direct to consumer, whatever you want to consider it and what you want to pursue. And writers get very confused by that notion, because if you're transitioning from like a non-business related field into writing, you might not understand that B2B and B2C even existed. What was the difference? Like, what was that big shocking difference you spoke about? Yeah. So so, so I was writing packaging copy, you know, campaign creative slogans. It was cool. Brand stories for like, I worked on like Durex condoms and Axe deodorant. I did like a sex, st- I did a dildo. Like I did <laughs> all kinds of stuff. And it was fun because it was all about personality filled copies. So you were trying to make an object have a vibe and a story to tell. And you're trying to like humanize it. And it was very tight writing, very punchy, if I say so myself, very punchy, very human personality fun. And it's like, yeah, I just want, you know, to make people feel a certain way. B2B, when I fell into B2B, you know, in the enterprise space, oh, it was like the opposite. At first it was like, it was serious. It was long form. It was technical. And it was trying to simplify kind of these complicated things. Now I found success in B2B because I took, you know, ideas from B2C and brought it to B2B, but I didn't really know the difference. And I think one thing that I know this happened to me when I was starting out, and I think it's very, very, you know, can happen to other writers is you get faced with that question. And it's just like, you can get paralyzed. Like, I don't know, do I want to do this or that? Do I want to write emails? So I always say in the beginning, you know, gravitate towards brands, companies that you just, you're interested in. And so you want to write for them and then uh, offer and write a bunch of things. And then the things that you really like writing, you know, like go for it. So me, I loathe writing emails, like ask me to write an email and I'm just going to run away, you know, but it's writing, but it's just, it's a very specific skill set talent. And I have tremendous respect for copywriters who write kick-ass emails. I can't do it. You know, it's, there's so many different ways to apply writing and so many different skills needed. And it's really hard, I think, to decide or niche until you've tried a bunch of things and sort of see how it went. Yeah. I really like that advice to just understand what brands you gravitate towards and would be interested in writing for. And the pattern of whether you're B2B or direct to consumer really emerges once you have a portfolio and you can pinpoint a pattern and say, oh, I tend to gravitate towards this. And this tends to be a consumer audience versus a business. So I, I really like that. Talk to me about, I was watching a video of yours where you talk about head-based messaging versus heart-based messaging. Cause I think that also is on the same, it's in the same vein as this, con- you know, consumer versus business audience. And I, I do think that writing toward the heart is key in B2B. I also think that, cause I'm very tapped in on LinkedIn with all of like the content marketers and every post seems to be about like, here's how to not make B2B boring, but what does that actually mean? Yeah. 
I know I'm, this is what my career is all about. It's just like <laughs> banging on about this stuff. You know, heart-based versus head-based is really important for B2B because there is this belief that the rational argument will always win. So an ROI number is going to be some kind of soft message trying to make you feel something. And that isn't true. And so I just think in B2B, people tend to over rotate on facts, figures, explaining, trying to appeal to this rational brain and convince them to buy a certain thing. And you know, the story that I used in that talk that you're referencing was how me as a consumer, like converted off of a random ass Facebook ad for an ebook and ended up spending 25K on a business course. Like seriously, just like that. And everyone in B2B would say like, no one converts off an ebook and like, no one does that. And, but I did, and it was because it spoke to my heart. So in my messaging framework that I teach, I train marketing teams how to do messaging strategy. And one of the biggest questions is like, well, how do we know where to focus our message? And, and what aspects of our you know, product do we talk about? And I always say, look, you want to find kind of the, the intersection between the things that truly motivate your customer to buy. And it's often an internal kind of heart-based thing. It is a deep motivation, whether it's wanting to achieve something or wanting to overcome something, you have to tap into that deeper motivation. And yes, it needs to intersect with what your product can uniquely deliver, but you need to understand what's really motivating people to actually buy because it's especially, you know, in B2B, it's very easy to not buy. There's just a lot of no decision right now and people just sticking with the status quo because the messages are just very boring. And so when you can have messaging that actually mirrors specific problems and desires that your customers actually been thinking about, if you can mirror that in the messaging, you connect with their heart, you connect with a different place, they sit up, they pay attention, they start to trust you, and it just works so much more. And so that's it. I hate the ROI thing. People don't ask me anymore. Back in the day, clients would be like, what's the ROI? You know, and now I say it's emotional ROI. It's like you can feel it. You know it's right. It's it's a feeling. We can't measure everything. You know, we can't convince everyone of everything. So that's what I really just try and share with with the B2B world. Yeah, it's like people buy based on emotion first and then they rationalize later. And that's why it's so confusing for a lot of people because they think, no, 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 I am a rational buyer. I do this and this and this. So I know it's rational, but it's people, I think they miss the emotional reaction that got them to take action in the first place. That's right. (laughs) You know, it's interesting. There's like this copywriting technique or whatever you want to call it, where they call it entering the conversation in the reader's head. And I, I heard you refer to it in one of your videos as like a dog whistle where it's Mm -hmm. like, there's something you can say that's going to make their ears perk up. Talk to me about that from a copywriter's perspective. Let's say you've been hired by a client. How do you, and especially for the companies that don't have built out personas and audience research and the, the materials, how do you enter the conversation that's going on in their head? And how do you know what their problems are, their desires to touch on them. Hey, real quick, if you constantly hear about these freelancers who are finding higher paying clients and you just don't understand how that's happening or what you might be doing wrong, definitely check out this workshop. I share with you how to spot the telltale signs of higher paying clients. You know, the ones that actually have the budget to pay you what you're worth. You're also going to learn how to position yourself correctly so that you actually appeal to those clients that have the budget and want to hire you as a freelancer. Plus, I'm going to share three key areas of your LinkedIn profile you can optimize right now so that you actually have clients reaching out to you. And then finally, I'm going to show you how to write non-salesy, non-cringy cold pitches so that you can proactively land those higher paying clients that you've been dreaming of, the logos that are going to boost your online presence and make you an authority as somebody credible in your niche. Also, if you just find yourself going in circles, you're stuck in analysis paralysis and don't know what next step to take, this workshop is going to help you gain that clarity. If you're wondering if you can actually make this whole self-employed full-time income as a freelancer thing work, 
This workshop is going to help you feel way more confident. The freelance world can seem like information overload. So if you're ready to break free from that, take my free workshop. It is linked down below. It's called the Find and Pitch Higher Paying Clients Workshop. Yeah. I mean, so if you, with my process, we, we interview customers, but if you don't have access to the customers, a popular one is, you know, mining reviews. So if you know, you're working for a company, it's either, if it's software, it's, it's reading their reviews or similar companies that offer the same thing. Could also be books that are solving that problem as well on Amazon. That's one place you can kind of snoop around and see like, hmm, what are problems that people keep talking about again and again? Problems that you people keep talking about again and again are problems you should probably be addressing in your messaging. If there's any way to get you know, anyone on the phone who either represents that buyer or is one of those buyers or someone who thought about buying, but didn't, those are gold. Cause then you can really ask them, well, what made you, what made you, you know, consider this in the first place? And you can ask why, and you can really dig into those questions. So any way that you're able to do that, you know, some market research reports that are out there could be helpful. But once you've done that, I think the key of that that concept of entering the conversation in the prospect's mind, which I think it was Robert Collier that first coined that like a hundred years ago, is using their language, right? And just saying the things they're thinking in their head. So one of my stories that I share in my training course is when this happened to me, and it was this bank that's not around anymore. This online bank is called Simple. And they had this headline at this copy and it was like, never, oh God, never feel fear, never be afraid to check, you know, to check your account balance again. And it talks about this budgeting tool and how it already will know like what you have to spend. So you don't like blow the budget. And then it was like, we're looking at you, English majors, like winky face. And I was like, and at the time. I used to be afraid to look at my bank account because it was scary. And it was like, and I was an English major and I read this and I was like, oh my God, it's speaking to me. And I became a loyal customer until they exited and, and went away. But that's a moment where, you know, it was the dog whistle effect. So tons of people who aren't English majors who are good with their personal finances wouldn't have even, they would have just, they wouldn't have even noticed that, right? But me, the perfect fit, saw it like it stood out and that's the dog whistle effect. <laughs> I love that. And it's actually a perfect segue because I was also an English major and we have definitely the stereotype with the major of like, oh, you get this bachelor's degree that you spend all this money on you wind up becoming a barista. And it's like half true in a way, because a lot of the time English majors don't know exactly what to do after college unless they take very traditional routes. But then if you can get into the world of marketing and copywriting, it can be extremely lucrative. There, there are lucrative jobs for English majors. So let's segue into kind of your journey and how you got to be here and the different types of jobs you've had, because everyone listening to this is someone who wants to take a non-traditional path. Good, because that's the only path I can talk about. I was crap at the traditional path. Same thing, English major. My parents like really tried to get me to not do that, but it was just like, this is this is me. I mean, and even worse, I majored in creative writing. So it's like the creative writing path of the English degree. So it was like the super unhelpful one. And it's bullshit to say that it's not helpful because being able to communicate and think critically is a superpower for anything you do in life. I hate the societal narrative that English majors are useless. I hate the societal narrative that like doesn't value art. And I think it's a huge problem. So fuck those people, right? And there's, I'm an English major that, you know, is now experienced a lot of success, but I didn't know what to do. When I graduated college, I didn't know what to do. I think I remember Googling, like, what do English majors do for a job, honestly? And PR came up. So I got my first job at a PR agency. It was the worst job of my life. It was like a devil wears Prada situation where I was Anne Hathaway and I had an evil man as my boss. So I did that. And then I went into, I worked at Random House Publishing in New York City in graphic design because I had interned at, at Penguin in college and I met these editors and I realized that wasn't right for me. I knew I wanted to write a book one day and I knew I didn't want to be an editor. 
So I was a graphic designer and I started writing blog posts on the side for free. I would, you know, review bands and albums and things like that. And it was, I remember I got a job interview. It was at FHM Magazine to do layout. And he looked at my resume and he was like, okay, I'm confused. I see half writing and half graphic design. Which one would you choose? And I was like, sorry, writing. And he's like, all right, you're not getting this job, this graphic design job. And that was a reminder like, okay, I need to pursue this. But I was living in New York City and I couldn't afford, I just couldn't afford like freelance writing in New York City in my 20s. So I had an opportunity. I just left my life there and I moved to, this is wild sounding, but I moved to Puerto Rico with a boyfriend at the time. And I lived in the jungle for six months and I worked on a novel. I was like, I went to the other end of the spectrum. I'm like, just going to write every day. And I thought I got to make some money. And so there's this book. I'm dating myself here. There's a book. It was like a phone book. People probably don't even know what a phone book is. It's a huge (laughs) book. And it's called The Writer's Market. And it was where it was a list of all these publications that were accepting queries from potential writers. And I went through there and I got a gig writing reviews of hotels for like 50 bucks a pop. So I would ride boats around like the Virgin Islands and I would review these hotels. And it was like really weird time of my life. But that was the beginning of getting, that was the first time I got paid for writing. I was just making it happen. And then from there, I moved to the UK. And I was temping at a methadone clinic, like applying for jobs. And after about six months, I scored a job at, you know, this publishing, writing in magazines. And so what I'm saying here is every time I moved forward closer to something I wanted, it was after I took a big risk and bet on myself. So these stories are just examples of like a non-traditional, non-linear path. Because no one was like, here's what you could do as, you know, as a writer and, and here's what's possible. So it was just really this going on and just following what lights me up, moving closer to this thing that I wanted to be doing, but there was no set way for me at all. It was very much just trusting what I enjoyed and and moving forward and never giving up on the dream of like, I want to write and I want to get paid. Cause to me, that was like the ultimate is making a living as a writer. So just a completely non-traditional path. Like I couldn't tell you what, you know, how, how to do it, but it's just, don't, don't give up, keep going, keep following. Oh, I love that. I relate to your story in so many ways because I graduated as an English major and I lived in New York city right when I graduated. And it was like, what job will hire a recent graduate. I cannot, you know, play around and whatever. Cause I had to start paying rent and like supporting myself. And then it's so interesting because you try all of these different things and you're trying so hard to get closer to what you want. Like I was a, a ESL instructor. I forayed into that. I was in sales. I tried tutoring on the side on the platform. And it was like all these like failures and feeling very lost, Mm -hmm. but never letting go of like the ultimate goal, which like I knew I wanted to, I I didn't really know freelance writing existed. Mm -hmm. I kind of only learned about the marketing world being in startup sales because sales and marketing kind of work closely together in a startup. I just knew that I wanted to be doing something that played on my strengths, but I had no confidence and no idea of what path to take. I feel like we should go into colleges and start really like educating the English department about how to guide students because in my school, anyway, I went to Pace in New York City yeah, and yeah. they literally just said, you're either going to go on and get a master's degree and become like a PhD or you're going to work for a nonprofit or you're going to go the publishing route. And the first publishing course I took was like comma splices. And we got that book, dirty girls grammar guide or whatever. And I was like, this is not for me. This is so boring. (laughs) So the marketing was completely sequestered to the business side of the school and pace is a predominantly business school. So it was like, well, we're the English majors, we're the liberal arts majors and we're over here and the business people are over there and nobody ever connected the two, which is why it took me till the end of my twenties to finally become a freelance copywriter. Yeah. Well, you did it faster than I did. So well done. I mean, like, (laughs) 
<laughs> it, so I think, you know, it's the societal thing. It's like, oh, business is here and English majors are here when actually creative people are some of the best business people. And, and that's what I really kind of want to say to all the people listening right now. The fact that you want to pursue a career in writing or you want to be a freelance writer means you are a creative spirit. You are a creative person. And we are special. We are not like everyone else, just, you know, kind of okay with the status quo or like going up the wrong, the linear this or that. By nature, we want to express ourselves. And hey, society's not all about celebrating the expression of creativity. So we're free thinkers. We're people who want to do things our way. We're people who want to feel joy and freedom and just do our thing. And it can be hard to figure out how to fit that in with the world, society, our family's expectations, our friends' expectations. There's no really kind of set path. And so that's what I just want to say. It's like, it's awesome what you're doing. It's not like some pipe dream or I don't know, like you failed up until this point. It's it's who you are. It's it's not like a coincidence. And just once you start believing that and thinking, yeah, this is me and I'm awesome and the world needs more of me, things get better. So my business exploded when I started understanding this. I felt so much shame. I'm you know a smart person. I probably have a high IQ, high IQ, but you know, I kind of underperformed school bored me. I never stuck with things, you know, I kind of flit to this and that. And so there was a lot of shame, like, oh, I didn't really turn out the way I could have turned out. Or, you know, if I got serious earlier, where would I be and all that. And it's like, we're all in our own timelines. And these wild and weird and wonderful scattered non-traditional paths are what make us so damn interesting. And what make us so unique as writers, if you don't experience the world, you can't be a good writer. Like you need experiences and different ones. And so you got to celebrate it, you know, and really honor it. Yeah. I really want to double down on what you said about kind of accepting yourself and what you're prone to, because I felt so much shame for so many years, jumping from job to job. Like I think the term job hopper is becoming out of style at this point because Mm -hmm. most people understand now, which I can't believe this is normalized. People understand that to progress in your income, that you actually should be leaving these companies rapidly. But when I was first in my sales career, jumping from company to company, it was so frowned upon and you were looked at as a flake and you know, oh, you out, you don't even have a year of experience here. And I was always so ashamed of that. And I can't tell you how much therapy and like soul searching it is, you know, I spent saying, what is wrong with me? Why can't I be like my friend right here? Who's completely content at their job. Who's saying things like, well, I just, you know, I just compartmentalize. Like, I don't need to love my job. I go there, I get the work done and I leave and I don't care. It pays the bills. I could never, for some reason, even though I tried, I wanted that mentality because it makes life a lot easier. I was always like, you know, it was just such a clash. Every job was such a clash. And once I actually accepted that I wasn't cut out for the nine to five and that's okay. And that I'm just wired a certain way. That's when I finally, I think opened up to the freelancing path. And I'm like, wow, even though this is stressful, this is so much more in line with my style of working, like jumping from project to project and client to client. Totally. I think you you talked about how you're wired and that's a, that was a huge aha for me when I realized how I was wired and realized it was good and it wasn't this bad thing. So I, have you heard of the Colby assessment? No. So it's, I did it at a business course I was in, like a business program and it was game changing for me. And there's a lot of executive, there's a lot of coaches out there who can help you understand what it means, but it's a really simple assessment that gives you, you know, a couple of numbers that helps you understand how you're wired and the, the huge takeaway, and there's no good or bad. It's just like, you're, you're this, you're that. And the idea is once you know this, then you can start owning your strengths and then pulling in the support to help you with the areas that you're never going to be that. And that's cool. Find someone who can help plug that gap. So there's one number on there, which is called the quick start. And it's, 
you're either high, it's one to 10. You're either high, which means you'll just start a new thing. You, you'll just jump into it versus one, which is takes you a long time to decide and finally make the move. And I was 10 on quick start. And it's like, yeah, I will make a huge decision in two seconds and go do it. And people are always like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, I don't know. What is wrong with me? Like, I'm just, yeah, I'm going to move to another country. I got 300 bucks. Like, I'll be fine. And I saw this assessment. It was like, oh, that's me. Hey, you know what? This is also classic entrepreneurial measure as well. And so then it was like, okay, well, I need someone in my business who's a bit more grounded. We'll do some research and just help me. And I have someone in, in my business now. So the Colby assessment and also the Clifton, like the Strengths Finder, huge, right? The Strengths Finder, because it it articulates things that you kind of maybe sort of knew about yourself, but it makes you feel like these are strengths. These are good. And then you can start, okay, how can I weave these into my business? And how can I highlight these and just own that these are my strengths? I use the Clifton's Strengths Finder when I was in my unemployment error. I had I had quit my sales job with no backup plan. And I took a few months to literally just not work. And I like just to figure out my next move, which that little hiatus or sabbatical, whatever you want to call it, was so critical because it allowed me, it allowed my nervous system to relax from being in such a high pressure job and career. And it's because of that break and being able to kind of do that soul searching with the Clifton Strengths Finder that I looked into freelance writing and for once actually said, maybe that's possible for me. Cause I think what happens to a lot of people is like, they're sitting there and they're Googling, like, what's the best career for me work from home jobs. How do I not have a boss? Like everything that people are just trying to escape and they see the solutions basically laid out for them. We're so lucky that so much is available on the internet for free, yep. but unless you believe you can do it, it all falls on deaf ears because there's something like there's a, a block that goes up and you're like, well, okay, I can see that, but that's not possible for me. You know? Absolutely. And so, yeah, you could bring up a great point about me. You made space. And to be honest, I work with so many people, marketers, and I come across a lot of sales folks as well in tech companies. And I don't know how a lot of them do it. Such intense pressure that seems to never end. There's always another quarter so, you know, it never stops. There's always a big launch. There's always this. It is so stressful. And I think it's pretty interesting right now what's happening in tech. Something's happening. Like something's happening. You know, there was the work from home thing. And I think people are started to get a bit, get their lives back in a certain way. And now with the layoffs, I just think something really interesting is happening. So many people are reaching out to me every day saying, I'm thinking of leaving. I'm thinking of start my own thing. What should I do? A lot of marketing consultants. And I do think it's kind of the future. I would like to see it. It's how I run my business. I don't have full-time employees. I have contractors that I have long-term relationships with, but they have their own businesses and I'm one of their clients. And I feel like that's the way forward. Giving all this power to these huge companies, it's those huge companies frowning on jumping jobs. They want you to stay there and grind out. They want your blood, sweat, and tears. And I'm hoping that we get to a future pretty soon where people feel more empowered to do the work they want and, you know, live healthier, more balanced lives. Yeah, I I feel such a shift too with people wanting so badly to start their own thing and create a personal brand. And I think the overall impact is that companies are really going to have to think critically about like their culture and what they expect and how they deal with employees I, you know, it's funny on the personality test and the assessments topic, I am writing an article about remote work and I interviewed a executive recruiter who specializes in like talent acquisition for remote employees. And she was saying, you know, we have this remote work assessment personality tests. And I said, these personality tests are amazing, but I don't think the HR people or the companies understand how to read the data and act on it. Because I've taken within the corporate world, these awesome personality tests that were super enlightening, but did the company ever look at that and say, oh, well, I need to manage her this way. It's almost <laughs> like a futile exercise. And it's, like, oh, it's, a, it's a, a, they check a box. Well, we do personality tests to try to do this, blah, blah, blah. But they don't, change their processes, I, I find. So I'm, yeah, just, I'm hoping that 
corporations are going to, I guess, really try to get in the head of the employees to understand how to retain them. Not that they need to like, you know, get on their hands and knees and acquiesce to everything the employee wants, but there needs to be like an an in-between point. (laughs) Yeah, there, there does. There really does. I mean, the personality tests, yeah, there's, they're meant to be used in how you, yes, communicate and and run meetings and and all of that. I, I think it's really interesting. I'm very intrigued as to where it all goes, but, you know, I'm totally cheering on all the folks who are leaving and, kind of doing their own thing. I think it's, it's awesome. I mean, just making the decision to do it is huge, is huge. I'll, I'll end it on this and ask you this last question. This is kind of just related to like B2B tech and everything that's happening, happening with Silicon Valley bank and all of these layoffs and everybody's kind of freaking out. What are you seeing on the front lines, like working with these B2B tech companies? What are trends like do you think freelancers will benefit from this or I don't know? <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one. Like, what am I seeing? With, so one thing I will say is everyone is looking for great writers. So I get asked a lot because we don't do content at, at Punchy. We do strategy. So we get asked a lot if we know people. So I know that that is you know, being a good writer is in total demand. And that's something I would say to everyone for sure. In terms of (laughs) the explosion (laughs) that's happening in tech in general, I work with great companies where there isn't drama. There's still so many, so many good folks out there, great teams, happy employees, where they have that leadership they're, they're doing something great. They're trying to make the world a better place through technology. And it's not business as usual, but you know they're not running around with their hair on fire. So I want to say that there's still plenty. It's not all gloom and doom out there. Try not to get sucked into the vortex of negativity that is social media and like LinkedIn, right? All the panic and fear. I'm still seeing lots of opportunity. I'm seeing great companies doing great things. So don't give up or think that now's not a good time. It's now's a great time. Totally. It's all about how you view things. Well, I know I said I was going to end on that question, but I do have one more question. (laughs) Okay, no problem. (laughs) What would you say to the freelance writers who they're in a full-time job and they're really unhappy and they've been listening to this type of content nonstop and they just can't really seem to synthesize all of the information they're taking in and take action. Cause I think what me and you have in common is I think execution. And I think becoming self-employed is really all about execution, but the surveys that I get from aspiring freelancers and newer freelancers is like, I'm in analysis paralysis and I just can't move. Like I have, I, I've listened to all the podcasts. I've paid for all the courses okay. and I'm just not taking action. What would you say to them? Okay. So this is how I started. Okay. One, my belief is when you truly commit to something and you put it out there to the universe, it will bring you an opportunity right away, but you have to commit. It's this idea of like, you have to meet the universe halfway. And I'm sure you've experienced this. So what I did, I was at Shutterfly and I wanted to start my own business. And at the time I had my kids, I had only had two kids then and the middle one was very young. And so I made a commitment that my commitment to that dream was from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. would be my time to work on my business. I would create a website. We often obsess over the website, but I would do like, I would just, I would start, I would make a website. What I actually would say is instead of committing to make a website, commit to figuring out how to get one client, just one client. It's like, stop reading the information, stop because you will, there's too much out there. You won't know what to do until you just start working with people. So just commit to getting one client and set a time, commit to a set amount of time, whatever you can do to just have the space to do things, whether it's writing a blog post, writing a website, Now, what I always tell people who are like, I'm going to quit, like, what do I do? I actually would say, don't bother with a website. I would say, write an email, craft an email that you're going to send to all your friends, everyone you know, where you're saying, hey, I'm building a side hustle. And I'm, I'm, I would love to write emails for so-and-so and just get clear on like who you would like to help and what you could do. 
and get as specific as you can and send that email out to everyone you know and ask them, who do you know who might need this? You will get a job. You commit to time set and you commit to just putting it out there and letting some people know. I guarantee you will get something. Something will come through. So stop listening, stop learning, stop listening to all the things, commit to some time, do one action and just think, I'm going to get my first client and you will get that first client and then you will just take it from there. Yes, that's amazing advice. The thing about tapping your network, our inclination is always, oh, well, I know everyone. I know what they do and they definitely don't know someone who needs a writer or or else I would know about it. But you never know who somebody knows. Never know. So my one one of the biggest big tech clients I worked with was Outreach back in 2018. I mean, they were they were just starting to build out their marketing team. And that was through someone I knew. And it was like his brother-in-law was the head of marketing. And I just happened to send him. He's like, they're doing a message. No, he's like, I'm just, I'll just, I think they're doing a messaging thing. And it was like, and then it was one of the most meaningful projects that I had done at that point that really changed my direction. It was so random. I couldn't have known that. So you just, you aren't going to know unless you put it out there. Yes. Don't discount all the people, you know, you just, you have no idea. Yeah. I can't tell you how many students in my course have updated their LinkedIn profile and then had someone, you know, come out of the woodwork, a past employee and said, I had no idea you were doing that. We actually need that at blah, blah, blah. Or I know someone who needs that. So many people need writers. So many people need writers and they need good writers and thoughtful writers and people who care. Honestly, there's, it's like, there's a shortage out there. So there's a huge opportunity And yeah, just take that one action, just that one commitment and see what comes through and take that as evidence that you're doing the right thing. Yes. And I have to shamelessly plug my freelance template playbook because I have a template for notifying your network that you are becoming a freelancer. I know it's awkward to blast it out and say, hey, I'm a writer, but this template will give you a structure explaining to people what it is you're doing, what type of opportunities you're looking for in a very non-cringe way. So please, if you're listening, visit paidcopywriter.com and download the freelance template playbook that has 35 plus templates for every type of freelance situation and that being one of them. So I just thought that was appropriate to plug there. (laughs) Oh my gosh, totally. I did. So you've got one even better. Everyone who asked me, I will send them your way. (laughs) Well, Emma, this was amazing. I'm really honored that you came on the podcast. Tell everyone where they can find you and get in touch with you. Yeah, I think the best, you know, I'm on LinkedIn all the time. So you can follow me, Emma Stratton on LinkedIn. You can also sign up for my newsletter where I share messaging and copywriting, writing tips in general. So that's punchy.co forward slash newsletter. It's definitely a great place to learn more about writing. And uh, yeah, that's it for now. Yeah, and I do want every writer listening to this to follow Emma on LinkedIn, because especially if you're a B2B writer, the things that you're posting about, writers need to be having this conversation with their clients to kind of be in the know and sound well-informed and be a business partner versus just an order taker writer. So I really, that's why I've been following you and really appreciating your insights because you're speaking to a B2B audience, but I need to learn about what you are speaking to them about and you're a great resource for that. Thank you. I try to, I try to help, you know? (laughs) Absolutely. Thank you so much, Emma. Thank you. It was so fun. Thank you for having me.